Hello, Hello. Bibles, please, to the book of Matthew, the 17th chapter. Matthew chapter 17 in your Schofield Reference Bible, page 1023, page 1023. Beginning with the 14th verse, we will read through verse 21. The text verse is the 19th verse. We'll read responsibly verses 14 through 21. May we please all stand together for the reading of God's word. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples. And they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And let's pray. In Raphael's great painting of the Transfiguration, Christ is hovering over in heaven, up in the clouds in heaven, looking down on the earth. Below, there is a frantic father who holds a demon-possessed boy. The disciples in Raphael's painting of the Transfiguration have a look of failure and a puzzled look on their faces. And as the man has brought his son to them, there's Jesus hovering up at the top of the mountain in this painting in the clouds. The disciples are pointing up that way and looking to the man and his son. As if to say, he can do it, we can't. Perhaps this was best for them, that they could not do this. For he was soon to go away to stay. And maybe it was good that he went away for a little while, to let them know who did the work after all. Let them know whose power it was by which he had healed the sick, cast out devils, even on occasion, raise the dead. Perhaps it was good for these disciples to find out they couldn't do it alone. Maybe it was good that he went away for a while to let them see their futility of serving God. Are you listening? Of serving God alone. Realizing that the day was going to come and he'd be gone for good. It wasn't long until he was gone for good. And... Uh, because of that, they knew what to do. If Jesus had not gone at the transfiguration time to let them see their powerlessness, perhaps they would not have had that ten days of prayer in the upper room. Perhaps they would not have fasted and prayed down the power of God. And perhaps there would not even have been a Pentecost as we know it. So Jesus is gone just for a while. This man brings his son to Jesus and says, Would you help me? I'm sorry, the disciples said, Would you help me? And they tried, and they failed. And they asked the question when Jesus came down and after he had healed the boy, they said, Why could not we? You know, you can use failure either way. Now, by the way, I'm glad they asked the question. Why could not we? That's the only way they're going to find out how to do it. I'm glad they asked the question. You can use failure either way. 
You can use failure as despair and despair over failure and continue to fail. Or when you fail, you can say, I'm going to find out why I failed. I'm going to find out the reason. I'm going to succeed next time. And succeed next time. They did. Because they came to Jesus and asked the question, why could not we? Now, follow me carefully. Let me give you the answer. Why they couldn't. He said, this kind cometh by nothing but by prayer and fasting. This kind cometh by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, he said there's some things you can get but just a little prayer. But he said there are some things you will not be able to get unless you really pay the price. There are some things you can ask God for casually, and you can get them. But there are some things that's going to take a season of prayer. It's going to take fasting and prayer. Now, I want to say this tonight. I think one of the saddest things about the New Testament Christianity we have in our day is how little we really get a hold of God's throne and God's altar. I think one of the saddest commentaries about this modern fundamentalism, where we dot every fundamental I, we cross every fundamental T, and we are against everything that fundamentalists are supposed to be against, and you know I'm for that. But brother, there needs to settle on the church of Jesus Christ a supernatural, heaven-sent reality and power that the church of Jesus Christ does not have tonight. Now, let me tell you, what you said to the house, what is this kind? Jesus said, now there are some kinds you don't have to fast and pray to get. There are some things for which you can, can pray and get those things without fasting and praying. But now he said, there is a kind of thing that you'll only get by fasting and praying. Now, what does that mean? That means that you've got to keep on praying and go without food sometimes and pray all night sometimes and hang on to God sometimes for days and days and days. I mean, there's some, God simply said there are some things you're not going to get at a bargain basement blue uh, light Kmart special sale. You're not going to get it that way. He said there's some things you're going to have to want enough to where you learn to fast and pray and beg God. Now, what are those things? Follow me carefully. Basically, those things are things done for others. Things you pray for others. Do you ever notice the, what we call the Lord's Prayer? He starts off saying, as you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we come down to the first request, the first thing he's going to pray for. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, if you're praying for your daily bread, the answer's got to come that day. Is that right? Because if it's daily bread, it's got to come every day. So he says, okay, you're my children. I'll feed you daily bread if you ask for it. I haven't got to beg for that. God's child does not have to beg God for daily bread. It does not say, give us this day our daily New York Sir Lawrence Strip. It does not say, give us this day our Chateaubriand. It does not say, say, give us this day our stuffed pheasant. It says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, God says, I'll feed you because you are my children. All you've got to do is ask me. You know, it's interesting to me. Brother Keith, people come by here... Uh, uh, usually, they're begging for food. Now, not, not the people in the church here that have it a little tough, but they're begging for food. And they'll say, we just haven't got anything to eat at our house. Usually, they weigh 240. And then the men weigh more than that. I mean, uh, we just have an awful hard time. Uh, we, have, we have nothing to eat in our house. Well, you must have drunk a lot of water the last few days, I'll guarantee you for sure. Now, what I'm trying to say is this. God says, I'll give you your daily bread because you simply ask for it. Now, he said this. He said, if you are going to be enter into my work and be a co-laborer with me to feed my people, you're going to have to fast and pray to get that. Let me illustrate. I go down to the bakery and I want to buy a loaf of bread. And they say to me, uh, okay, fill out this application form. I'm going to buy a loaf of bread. Is that what they say? No, they don't say that. They don't say, okay, name, address, 
Where do you work? Give me some references. Don't say that. Buy a loaf of bread, you buy a loaf of bread. You go to the same bakery and ask if you can work there and see if you don't fill out a reference form, application form. You see, if you get bread from the bakery for yourself, you don't have to beg or apply. It's no red tape. But if they allow you to come into that bakery and work in the bakery and distribute bread to others, you're going to have to meet some qualifications and you've got to fill out an application. Now, God says that. God says, okay, there, there are two, two requests for bread in that prayer of the of uh, that uh, so-called Lord's Prayer. It says, give us this day our daily bread. Then it says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And then it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from without the power of the kingdom of God. Then he goes on to say, tells about a man who came to a, a friend at midnight and said, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Now, it's been years since I've, 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 I've taught on this or preached on this, and some of you have never heard this little illustration of it. Let me just illustrate it right now. Here's a, here's a fellow. Uh, and by the way, midnight was late back in those days. For you, it's just the time you're watching the Johnny Carson show. But uh, uh, another heathen rot, rotten junk, too. But uh, uh, I'm saying uh, uh, midnight, back in those days, they went to bed real, real early. And midnight was late. Every once in a while, some of our Howells Anderson boys will say, well, if John Wesley got up at 4 o'clock in the morning and prayed, I'm going to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and prayed. What you ought to know is that John Wesley went to bed at 8 o'clock at night, too. If you're going to get up with him, you better go to bed with him. Didn't sound real good, did it? <laughs> you know what I mean, don't you? I hate you smart, Alex. It started grinning before I admitted what it done. So this fellow came to a friend at midnight. Now look, back in those days, folks, and still in Israel, it's like this. They don't have... Every, every kid doesn't have his own room. And they all sleep in one room. And back in those days, they all slept in one bed. I mean the whole family. The whole side of the wall was a bed. Built in bed. You know, Grandpa slept here. Grandma slept here. Uncle George slept here. Aunt Susie slept here. Mama slept here, Daddy slept here, Junior slept here, and Mary slept here. All of them just lined up like that. Now it's midnight. Everybody's sound asleep. Guy's upstairs, he and his old family sleep. Grandpa, Grandma, I'm sorry, Grandpa, Grandma, uh, and, and Uncle George, and Aunt Susie, and Mama, and Daddy, and Mama, and Junior, and Mary. All of them sound asleep. This fellow comes at midnight. A friend comes at midnight to visit a certain guy, and he has no bread. So he decides to go to his other friend and, and, and ask him for bread. He goes at midnight. Hello! Hello! That was ringing the doorbell back in those days. Hello! Hello! Fella gets, and by the way, bear in mind this. He opens the window. What happens? Grandpa wakes up. Grandma wakes up. Uncle George wakes up. Aunt Susie wakes up. Daddy wakes up, Mama wakes up, Junior wakes up, and Mary wakes up. And a fellow goes to the window. Hey, what is it down there? He said, a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. He said, uh, could I borrow some bread? The fellow said, not now. Come back in the morning. I'll give you some bread. But I, uh, you woke everybody up. Now, don't, don't bother us. But, but look, I just need a little bit of bread. Don't even ask you for myself. I want to serve my friend. I want to be a hospital. He's been on a long journey. I'm supposed to feed him. Haven't got any bread. Just toss me a loaf of bread out the window. Would you do that, please? He said, no, sir. Come back in the morning. We're getting some sleep. Pulls down the window. Grandpa goes back to sleep. Grandma goes back to sleep. Uncle George goes back to sleep. Aunt Susie goes back to sleep. Daddy goes back to sleep. Mama goes back to sleep. Junior goes back to sleep. And Mary, you thought I'd forget them all, didn't you? And uh, <laughs> I was a little worried myself. Then Mary goes back to sleep. So about the time they get good sound sleep, this fellow's almost home. And he's going to go back and he's going to face his friend. 
and he has no bread. And he says, I've got to have some bread. I can't face my friend without bread. I'm going to go back and ask again for some bread. He goes back, looks up at the window. I can't do that. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'll go home and tell my friend I don't have any bread and couldn't get any. He goes almost home. Gets to the house. I can't go in. I can't face him without any bread. I can't do it. I can't do it. He goes back. Hey, hello. Hello. Grandpa wakes up. Grandma wakes up. Uncle George wakes up. Aunt Susie wakes up. Daddy wakes up. Mama wakes up. And Junior wakes up. And uh, Mary wakes up. Right. And uh, hey, friend, lend me three loaves. Friend of mine, his journey is telling me I have nothing to set before him. He says, look, I told you a while ago, I'm not going to have any bread tonight. I'm not going to do it. Now leave me alone. We, we're trying to get some sleep. Now go on, leave me alone. Close the window down. Grandpa goes back to sleep. Grandma goes back to sleep. Uncle George goes back to sleep. Aunt Susie goes back to sleep. Daddy goes back to sleep. Mama goes back to sleep. Uh, Junior goes back to sleep. Mary goes back to sleep. And the fellow goes home. He gets almost home and he says, I can't go there without the bread. I've got to have the bread. He comes back, ah, no, I'm scared. He'll kill me. He'll shoot me. I, 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 I can't do that. He goes back home. He's got to do one or two things. He's got to face the friend back to home without the bread, or he's got to keep on begging the guy who has the bread. So he goes back. Hey, hello. Grandpa wakes up. Grandma wakes up. Uncle George wakes up. Aunt Susie wakes up. Father wakes up. Mother wakes up. Junior wakes up. Susie, uh, Mary wakes up. Uh, there was a little visitor there named Susie Alto. She came in between the last time and spent the night with Mary. And uh, so I'm glad you're listening. And uh, so he said, friend, I've got to have some bread. I told you, you can't have any bread. This is the third time you wake this up. Now don't bother me anymore. Now look, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to stay out here and holler until I get some bread. Now, if you expect Grandpa to get in sleep, Grandma to get in sleep, and Uncle George to get in sleep, me and Susie to get in sleep, if you expect to get in sleep yourself and your wife to get in sleep and little Junior to get in sleep and, and Mary to get in sleep and Susie, her friend, to get some sleep, and Robert, uh, uh, and Robert, the, uh, the friend that came in the meantime to spend the night with Junior, if you expect him to get in sleep, you're going to have to throw me some bread. You're not going to get any rest. You're not going to do it till I get the bread. And the fellow says, okay, I'll throw you down a whole cabinet full of bread if you will let me get some sleep. Now, God says that's the way you get big prayers answered. He says if that man can, can get the bread from his friend, shall not the Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him. And that word ask is the linear, which means keep on asking, keep on asking, keep on asking. And Jesus said, I'll tell you fellas why you couldn't get that devil cast out of that boy. I'll tell you why you couldn't do the job while I was up on the mountain. This kind where you enter into my work and I work through you for others, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. This is the great need. I was thinking a while ago, Reading the scripture over Matthew 6 6, it says, When thou prayest. What does that mean? You're supposed to have a time to pray. Set time to pray. You won't get much praying done if you do it whenever it, you have time. You have a set time to pray. Set time. I mean, just like you get up at the same time, like you eat at the same time. Have a set time where you meet God and beg God. Let me tell you something. Somebody says, Well, I, I, I'm not a good soul winner because I, I'm just not very gabby. I know it's a lot of Gabby folks that don't win souls. It's not Gabby folks that win souls, Gabby to each other. It's Gabby folks to God that win souls. You come to God and you beg and you plead. And until we learn to walk with God and beg God and plead with God, the mighty power of God's not going to come back on our lives anymore. It says, when thou prayest, that means the time to pray. It says, enter into thy closet. That means a place to pray. Now, I don't think any place is more sacred than another, but I'll tell you what, you'll come near praying if you'll pray at the same place all the time. When thou prayest, that's the time, set time to pray. Enter into thy closet, a set place to pray. And then it says, in secret. That means alone. You want to, I'm not against praying together. 
But I'll be honest with you, for most of us, we pray with somebody else, we say a lot prettier things than we do when we talk to God alone. Dear Father, Thou the great omnipotent Father, Thou, we come to Thee as humble as we know how. In the first place, You are lying through Your teeth. Oh, Thou art our God and our Savior and our Father. He knows all that. He knew it before You came to Him. He knew what He was. Folks that get things done for God. I'm talking about folks that get things done from God. I'm talking about folks that God lets work in the bakery. That's the crowd who agonizes by themselves. I'm talking about night after night and day after day. There's a set time when you walk with God and there's a set place where you meet God. I met God in the morning when the day was at its best and His presence came like glory with His sunrise on my breast. All day long His presence lingered. All day long He stayed with me and He sailed in perfect calmness o'er a very troubled sea. Other ships were torn and battered. Other ships were sore distressed. But the winds that seemed to drive them brought to me a peace and rest. Then I thought of other mornings with a keen remorse of mine when I too had loosed the mooring of his presence far behind. So I think I've learned the secret, learned from many a troubled way. If you meet God in the morning, you can have him all the day. And God's people need to learn how to pray again. And God's folks need to learn how to have a schedule for prayer and time to pray and praying alone and walking with God and begging God and pleading with God. Jesus said this kind when you, when you get things for others, you're going to have to learn how to fast and pray. This is for others only. Now, I want you to tell me, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, if you listen carefully, what's wrong with your, your long praying. You spend your long praying, praying for something for yourself. And you wonder why God doesn't answer. You don't pray for things for yourself in that long praying. That long praying is praying for others only. Oh, you say, Brother Hiles, I fasted and prayed for that one girl. The fellow wrote me a letter a few weeks ago. Good night. He said, I got to have her. I got to have her. And he said, I fasted and prayed. Won't you join me in fasting and praying for her? You get her, you'll have to fast. No, I'm, I'm saying, uh, most of us, our heavy praying is for ourselves. God says he doesn't want us praying for ourselves a great deal. Let me illustrate, Brother John Carmen. Just happened to have a Reese peanut butter cup here. Where you and I are going to have some fun right here. It'll be the envy of 7,000 people all of a sudden. Brother John, you come to me. I got two little, this, this is going to represent bread. Now, that thing is pretty bad shape, John. <laughs> so are we. Uh, so are we, yeah. I <laughs> mean, we, white man. Okay, Brother John, you come to me and, and, and uh, I, I, uh, you come to me and ask me for some bread for yourself. I want some bread for myself. Sure, there it is right there. Now ask me for some bread for the center section of the choir. I oh. need some bread for the tenor section of the choir, too. Please, may I have some bread for the tenor section of the choir? I beg of you, please. May I have some bread for the tenor section of the choir? They're hungry. Look at it. <laughs> You see, that's what God is. Look, did you know when he asked for bread for himself, he said, may I have some bread one time, the word I. God's a little sick of you here using the word I. God didn't say, you say, may I have some bread, 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 may I have some bread. God said, no. He said, <laughs> I don't want you to hear the word I. To keep you from thinking about yourself too much, I'll give you the bread the first time you ask me. Now get out of business and pray for somebody else to have bread. So I'll give you bread. Tenors, thank you, Brother John. That'll keep you occupied the rest of the service, I think. <laughs> As I look back tonight over three score years, the highlights of my life have been the seasons of prayer mean that. As I look back over three score years, I think about that night in the piney woods of East Texas after I'd been praying and fasting for days. And that one night I prayed all night long.
Why? Because I wanted to win others to Christ. I wanted to reach others for Christ. I wanted God to let me work in His bakery and be a co-partner, be a co-worker, a partner in His bakery with Him. As I think back over these three score years, I think about that night years ago when I'd taken pastor of the Miller Road Baptist Church of Garland, Texas. I think about that first little Sunday we were there, had 44 people in Sunday school. On our first anniversary, 618. Second anniversary, 1180. Third anniversary, 2212. Fourth anniversary, 3163. And didn't run a single bus route. Buses were not run much in those days. We'd never heard about buses, bus routes, and so forth. Church got so big, I couldn't handle it. I was just a kid, preacher, just still in my late 20s. I couldn't handle the church. Never expected to pastor a big church. I remember that night. On a Saturday night, I decided I had to resign. I could not stay and pastor a church of that size. I always thought I'd be just a country preacher. In fact, when I went to college, I, I majored in Bible and also in secondary education with the, with the teaching field in history. So I, I, I knew I'd never have a church big enough to pay me a full-time salary. I figured I'd have to have a, a second job, so I was going to be a school teacher during the week and preach in some little country church on Sunday. That's all I thought I'd ever do. I remember... Church got so big I couldn't handle it. And I went to my office on Saturday night about six o'clock, going to resign the next day because I couldn't handle the church is too big for me. I was going. I wrote, wrote my resignation out, wrote it out. I was going to read it the next morning, something like this: Dear members of Miller Road Baptist Church, I love you as I love my own life. But I'm not big enough to handle this church anymore. I'm just a young preacher and a country preacher. I'll go somewhere and start another church and, and somewhere in some little neighborhood and build it up and then get, get it big. I'll go somewhere else. I'm not a big preacher. And I remember how I put that paper before me and I said, Dear God, I'm going to read this tomorrow, but I promise you this, I'm going to spend all night in prayer. This was on New Year's Eve, I think it was. About 8 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, I began to pray, and I prayed till 7, I prayed to 8, I prayed to 9, I prayed to 10, I prayed to 11. Oh, it must have been about midnight, I guess. Somebody knocked on the door of the study. I looked in with the door, and it was a, one of our deacons named S.O. Barnett. Big, tall fella, had his, had his pants on over his pajamas, and, and you could see his big old feet sticking out, and no socks on, shoes weren't tied, and both his hairs were messed up on his head. He was standing there, sleep in his eyes. He said, Preacher, what's wrong? And I said, What do you mean, S.O.? He said, Something wrong with my preacher. God told me tonight. He said, What's wrong with you? I said, Come in, S.O. I showed him that resignation paper. And I said, I'm going to, I can't stay. I'm not big enough. I don't know how to have a church this big. I don't know what to do. I'm just a kid. He said, Let's pray. We prayed all night long. He prayed, I prayed, he prayed, I prayed, he prayed, I prayed, he prayed, I prayed, he prayed, I prayed all night long. We didn't stop for coffee or donuts or hot chocolate all night long. We prayed and cried. About 6 o'clock the next morning, just as real as if I'd felt a hand physically, I felt the hand of God on me like I'd never felt Him before except on the grave of my daddy. And I knew that God had given me a special portion so I could pass to the church and I could handle the situation. And I said, yes, oh, I believe God's given it to me. And that big old deacon hugged me and I hugged him and we danced together on the walls around that room and clapped our hands and shouted, oh, I wish you knew what I'm talking about. I wish you knew what I'm talking about. I wish Christianity would get real to some of us. I wish somebody would become a good Christian. I wish somebody would believe there's a God in heaven who answers prayer. God says, if you want uh, some bread for yourself, ask me. But don't ask me too much. I'll give it to you in a hurry. I don't want to hear you talk about yourself. But he says, you want to work in my bakery and have blessings and power with others, you're going to have to learn how to fast and pray. You've got to learn how to hang on to me. I could stand here the rest of the night and tell you, about these three score and ten years that God has given me so many supernatural things. I remember that night at the Bill Rice Ranch, I decided to resign this church because I just felt like I couldn't handle the burdens of it. 
I decided to resign the church, but God wouldn't let me sleep that night. And all night I prayed for Bill Rice Ranch. If you go down there right now, right in front of that room 11, Bill Rice Ranch, where I prayed all that night, and God gave me a new, a new anointing for this ministry here. They've got my hand print out in front of it and my signature and a little piece of concrete and a sign out there saying, A certain night in 1960, Dr. Jack Howells prayed all night in this room and the great First Baptist Church of Hammond was started. Listen, let me tell you something, folks. What little thing God has done for me in my ministry and what little success my little ministry has had is not because of a talent. It's not because of a little humor. It's not because of a dynamic personality. I have none of that. It's because of God's mighty power. That's what it's because of. Oh, my God in heaven, give us something real again. Oh, I could tell you many other cases. I remember that little lady in our church years ago. She was over either the Passover Hospital in Chicago or the Wesley Hospital in Chicago, and uh, she had a brain tumor. I went over early that morning, took a little bottle of olive oil back in the days when the church was smaller and I could visit all the sick folk, but John does it now because the church is such a gigantic thing. But we didn't, we didn't have, in those days, we didn't have as many people are sitting in these two sections right here, total in the church. And uh, I went over early one morning. I opened a bottle of olive oil, was about to anoint her. I may have already put the oil on her brow, I don't know, and I started to pray for her, and all of a sudden, the doctor walked in. He said, Mister, you're going to have to leave. I said, Sir, I'll be glad to as soon as I finish praying. I'm, I'm her pastor, and uh, I, I'll finish praying. He said, We haven't got time for you to finish praying. You pray while she's having surgery. And I said, Doctor, I'm going to pray before she has surgery, right now, before you take her out. He said, No, you're not. He said, I'm taking her out now and haven't got time for you to go through your little religious exercises. He said, I'm taking her out now. I said, no, no, take more than you take her out now, Doc. He said, for your information, I am the surgeon. I said, for your information, I am the man of God. Oh, he got mad. He said to the little lady lying there, he on the bed, one of our fine ladies, he said, would you tell this reverend to go out in the hall while we get you ready for surgery? She looked up at him in a sweet little voice. She said, Doctor, would you go out in the hall while we have a prayer meeting? That heathen doctor went out in the hall. He, he performed religious exercises, too. He was offering up burnt offerings all the time. And uh, I prayed in order with all, and I said, Oh, God, there's a heathen doctor out there right now. This sure would be a good time for you to convince him there's a God in heaven. I said, in God's Jesus' name, oh, God, I pray you'd come in power and heal this lady. Oh, God, I'd seen the tumor. I'd seen it. I'd seen the x-rays. I mean, I, it's right there. You could see it. And I, uh, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And finally the doctor came in. I said, Doc, you can come on in now. He took her off. It was going to be a surgery, five or six-hour surgery. In less than one hour, he rolled her back down the hallway toward her room. And I said, Doc, uh, what happened? Is surgery over? He said, didn't have surgery. I said, why didn't you have it? He said, tumor's gone. Tumor's gone. You know, you said, Brother Howes, you sound like Pentecostal. Listen, Baptist people are getting folks healed 1,800 years before Pentecostalism was ever invented. Oh, you said, where's the Lord God of Elijah? He's the same place he was when Elijah was here. Same place. Just needs some Elijahs, that's all. Well, if I could get, if we could get one church in America, get the people to pray as much as they talk, the mighty power of God would come. Guarantee you. Mighty power of God would come. But that's in the past. Listen carefully to me now. I said, as I think back over these three score years, how I thank God tonight for what He's done for this preacher. The three score. But this last week I almost had a shout and fit. Because in Psalm 90, verse 10, it doesn't say three score, it says three score and ten. I got ten more to go. And I aim to fulfill them. I got ten more to go. You know. I like those two words and ten. Didn't think it ever, it ever stuck out like they're sticking out real big right now. 
I love those words. And ten! And ten! And ten! And ten! I've been talking to God about that lately. And ten! And ten! I said, God, how about that and ten? I almost preached on that and ten. Boy, that'd be a good sermon on the antenna. <laughs> I've never wanted to help others more in my life than I want to tonight. I've never believed this book and believed the God of this book like I believe it tonight. And I've never loved Him, and I mean that. And I'm not bragging. I'm telling you the God's truth. He knows I'm telling you the truth. I've never loved Him like I love Him tonight. I've never enjoyed preaching as much as I've enjoyed preaching recently. And I enjoy preaching more tonight than I did ever have in all of my ministry. I'm saying I have prayed, never prayed in all the three score and ten. I've never prayed as much as I've prayed in the last few years. I've never looked forward to a decade any more than look forward to the next decade. The other day, somebody called the office and asked Ms. McKinney, he says, is it true? So I've been talking about getting old so many years. Folks get my tapes. They're getting a little concerned. They call in. They, and they'll across the country. But how's you, you sound like you're preaching it, that you're going to resign. Somebody called Ms. McKinney and said, the well, house has been preaching. Is he, he going to resign? Oh, no, no, no. Brother Howell is not going to resign. I'm claiming that and ten, and ten, and ten, and ten, and ten, and ten. And let me serve notice tonight. The greatest days in the history of this old church will be the next ten years. I'll guarantee you, you wait and see. You wait and see. I'm just getting to the finishing kick. I've just run six laps. I've got one more to run, boy, and that's where the race is run in the sixth lap. Seventh, seventh, seventh lap. And ten! And ten! You wait. No church in the history of this nation or in the history of Christianity had ever baptized more than 3,000 people to the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. Baptized 3,000 people. Now you listen to me. I'll guarantee you something. And you just stick around and watch it, Buster. We're going to baptize in the, in the next year, our 100th anniversary, we're going to baptize 10,000 people in this baptistry right here. You wait and see. You wait and see. Never been done. We baptize six, 7,000 a year, but I want to serve notice tonight. Listen, we're not going to have next year just a spring program and fall program. We're going to have a winter program, a spring program, a summer program, and a fall program. And the hundredth year of this old church is going to be the mightiest, most powerful year this church has ever had. Serve notice. I'm serving notice tonight. We on our way. I'm saying God is alive. And God is on His throne. And the Bible's still true. The church is marching on. I'm preaching it tonight because I'll be 60 years old in a few days, but and 10. And 10. I promise God to give Him all I have. To ask Him for 10 years. I promised Him I'd give Him all I had. to give me 10 more. I told Him last night, give me 10 more years. And I'll be willing then, if you want me to, the way I feel now, let you take me on to heaven. However, I do not know how I'm going to feel about it then. <laughs> Don't hold me to everything I'm saying. You changed your mind back down in the book of Exodus. i got to right change mine. But right now I'm asking him for ten. I promise God to give him the next ten years all I have. I promise you tonight to give you all I've got for ten years. I promise to give my remaining days to others. That's all I want to do. God knows that's all I want to do. You just give me another hand, another head to cradle in that arm and tears to wipe. You just give me another wayward son or wayward daughter to help and encourage. You just give me another person that's discouraged, a little widow I can help to feed, or a child I can help keep in school, or somebody I can help make it. Just give me somebody like that. Let me have ten years of it, God. Ten years and ten. That's what this kind is. This kind is for others only. Quit being so all-fired selfish, you little selfish, self-seeking, self-centered, penury Christian. Think about somebody else. Beg God for His mighty power so you can work in the bakery. I've been waiting to preach this sermon.
couple weeks now. I've been hanging on to this and 10 business for weeks. Every Sunday, every Saturday, I've said, God, now? No, not yet. You know why? How did it why? Because I heard Dr. Bob Jones Sr. say many years ago, I'll never forget it. He said this before I ever became pastor here. Heard him say it about 30 years ago when I was preaching with him in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He said in a morning service, he said, young, he said, preachers, keep your testimony fresh. Keep your testimony fresh. I could tell you about people all over this room tonight who've had cancer for whom we fasted and prayed and God has healed their bodies and cured their cancer. They're all over this room tonight. I can tell you all over this room tonight, mamas and daddies that have little babies that the doctors said was impossible to have, we anointed them with oil and prayed for them, and God in His mighty power opened barren wombs and gave life to dead seed, and they have children. And I've been saying, dear God, as soon as you do something real extra special, I won't preach that sermon, but I don't want to preach it with illustrations that took place 25 years ago. Or even a year ago. Give me some real fresh ones and I'll preach it. Last Sunday afternoon, I walked out to the car to go pray a while in the woods. Little lady was getting in her car. She waved over at me and she said, Brother Hiles, I don't have the cancer anymore. Her husband was there with her, child. I said, what do you mean? She said, remember a few days ago I had cancer? She said, uh, doctor says I'm healed now. That's not 25 years ago. That's less than a week ago. In fact, that's last Sunday, I think it was. may have been two weeks ago. Still works. Still works. I was in Santa Clara, California this last Monday and Tuesday night. On Monday night, a little lady and her husband walked up and said, here he is. I said, what's that? She said, the miracle baby. She said, remember a year ago, we came and said, God, the doctors say we cannot have, have, have a baby. Remember how you anointed us a year ago? She said, within a matter of a few days, she said, I was pregnant. And she said, here's the miracle baby. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not going to take any credit. In fact, I don't take credit for any of this. Give God the credit. I'm dragging on God, not you, not me. But I've been, I've been a little delinquent about something. Dr. Ashcraft, missionary for many years down in Monterey, Mexico, and a friend of many of us, had cancer. And I'll be honest with you, I feel, I, I've been delinquent about praying for him. I knew him well, but I've been so busy and so many things to do, and, and day and night, and, and I've just, I, I just been delinquent. Last Wednesday, I got to think of Dr. Ashcraft. Seven doctors had examined him at seven different times, and all of them said he had cancer where? Some? In the bladder, cancer of the bladder. All seven of them. I decided Wednesday to go out in the woods and give about an hour to Dr. Ashcraft alone. And I went out in the woods, and I fell on my face in the woods, and I begged God for one solid hour for God to heal Dr. Ashcraft, that missionary of many years. I'm not saying my prayers did it. My God did it. Thursday morning is a little note put on my desk. Blessed be God. Thursday morning, a note put on my desk, and they'd call from down there where he was, and they'd said the doctors have just found out the cancer's gone. Gone. He's healed. Gone. You say, you didn't do it. No, God did it. Well, he didn't do it in answer to your prayer. I'm not trying to say he didn't answer to my prayer. I'm trying to say he still does it. Friday, after Friday night, I preached in Midland, Michigan. Had a flight to Michigan, Midland Bay City, Saginaw Airport. The plane's supposed to leave 2:14. This doesn't mean anything to you, but it does to me, because I was I was studying and asking God if I could preach this sermon and outlining it, because I felt like God is ready. The plane's supposed to leave at 2:14. Arrive in Midland 5:05 their time, an hour later than our time. About 2.14, 2.10, they came on the intercom and said, 
flight to Saginaw will not leave until 2.25. Well, I didn't have much time. That's 3.25 up there. It's over an hour's flight. And you got to have to drive about 30 minutes to the church. Well, an hour and a half, I guess. Uh, uh, two hours, at least two hours from the time you, I left the gate to the time I got to the church. 2.25, they came on and said that flight to Saginaw won't, won't, won't leave till 2.40. 240 came on and said the flight to Saginaw won't leave till 255. 255 they came on and said the flight to Saginaw won't leave till 305. That's 405 there. Service starts at 7 o'clock, 2 hours and 55 minutes. If it leaves at 405, I can't make it. Finally, it backed out about 430, uh, well, 330, 430 Saginaw time. It backed out. It took us 30 minutes to get from the gate to the runway because of traffic. Now it's five minutes after five, their time. Hour and 55 minutes, I'm supposed to, they're supposed to start, start that service. If we leave at this minute, I said, I said, God, if we leave at this minute, I, I can get there in time to rush right to the pulpit and, and go right to the pulpit and preach. Got out the runway. Seventeen planes lined up on the runway we were on ahead of us. Now, 17 planes, by the time you have 17 take off, you've got several land in between that on the same runways. You're talking about 45 minutes sitting out there. I said, God, if I have to wait for those 17 planes to take off, I said, I won't preach tonight, and I want to preach tonight, and you know I do it. I've got, I said, God, do something. I'd no sooner have said it. I was in little, these little, little commuter planes, kind of made out of chicken wire and, and, and crates. All of, and all those 17 big old jets lined up in front of us to take off. All of a sudden, that pilot turned that little thing to the right, took off down a side runway, and passed every one of those uh, big old jets, 17 of them. Everybody on that plane said, never seen anything like this before in my life. Wonder what's happening. I said to a fellow across the aisle, I said, God's getting me there in time to preach. That's what's happening. As we, we rolled by those 17 jets, I waved out the window at them. Yeah. And he took off, first of all, took off right away. My Lord said, you can preach it now, son. You can preach it now. I, uh, Brother Ray Young, I'll vouch for this. My heart's been broken about this bus thing. We have the same amount of money in our bus ministry we've always given. Our budget for the buses, but all oh, the insurance has skyrocketed and the lease has gone way high. And I'll be honest with you, I can hardly take it every Sunday morning when I stop and realize there are people standing on the street want to come to church and they can't come to church. Want to come? And I've been praying about this $150,000 we need. Brother Ray, you remember I told you the other day we were talking, I said, Brother Ray, I don't have $150,000 worth of faith. What did I say? Remember how much? No, I said 75, half of it. I said, I haven't got $150,000 worth of faith. I said, I, I want us to have $150,000, but I said, I, I, I'd settle right now for 75000 So I was praying for 75000 Now listen to me. There's a God in heaven. The other day I was in my office praying for 75000 And I said to myself, you sorry rascal, you. God on seventy five thousand can dead sure find another seventy five thousand. And I said, Dear God, I'm not going to ask you for seventy five thousand anymore. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to ask you for hundred and fifty. I'd no sooner said that thirty minutes than thirty minutes after I said that, looked over and under the door there came an envelope about that big. I'm about to shout. I opened that envelope. Member of this church had written a little note. Dear Dr. Brother Hiles, God is able. Signed his name. Opened the envelope. Brother Ray, there was a check in that envelope for one hundred thousand dollars. I danced all over the office. 
And I said, Lord, you're going to have an awful hard time keeping me preaching that sermon Sunday night. This kind. This kind. This kind. For others. That's the difference. For others. Or I get big prayers answered. You're praying for yourself. For others. You want to work in the bakery? They have jobs open. But you won't work in the bakery with the same little piddling request with which you buy bread. Why could not we? Why could not we? I'll tell you why. Because this kind, where you become a co-laborer with God and a partner in God's work, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Father.